afternoon. We are about to begin session three, Infectious Diseases 2. I would like to invite as a chairperson Ricardo Godoy from Fiocruz, Rondonia. So, uh, good afternoon, you all. Um, I will be briefing the introductions because we're going to have a very long uh, session right now and we have the additional uh, after lunch effects, so <laughs> we need to. Uh, so, we will we'll start with Jose Henrique Piloto and, they will, and, and he will uh, uh, make a co presentation with uh, Daniel Scott Algarra. And uh, after, we will have a, a, a change in the order of the presentations. Uh, so Fabrice Cretien will present muscle regeneration in this impaired during sepsis, followed by Patricia Reis. And then uh, we have uh, the pleasure to hear Professor uh, José Rodrigues Coda and Paulo Minotto, Minotto to, to end the session. And uh, after the, 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 the presentations, we'll have some time for some questions. And I, uh, I will ask the presenters to take uh, 15 minutes so we can have some time to discuss. So I would like to invite Jose Henrique Piloto for the first talk. So first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, make this presentation and show some data uh, some preliminary data of our study and uh, before everything I would like to introduce the AIDS and Molecular Immunology Lab where I work and the director is Monique Guimarães and our colleagues from the lab have asked me to uh, introduce you to the main lab research areas that we have been working on uh, in the past years. So we are most of the time focused on um, uh, pathogenesis of HIV infections and we have been following a cohort of uh, HIV elite controllers and long-term non-progressors individuals for the development of vaccines and new therapeutic strategies. This cohort is being followed at the National Institute of Infectology at uh, Fio Cruz. So we have also interest in it's the, the, the focus of our presentation today with HIV and other co-infections like TB, tuberculosis, leprosy, leishmaniasis, and to study innate and uh, acquired immune reconstitution in HIV TB co infected patients. Also, we have been contributing in collaboration with uh, many uh, international networks like the ACTD, HPTN, CDC, IMPACT, and ANRS. So, we have been doing clinical trials for the pre prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV, taking care of maternal infant health and also looking at the adult population. Also, uh, HIV clinical trials and observational studies to evaluate the very, very early use of highly active antiretroviral therapy for adults and children. It's clinical and lab markers to define parameters of viremia control, disease progression and functional curve. Also, epidemiological studies, molecular surveillance, and transmitted and acquired resistance to antiretrovirus in Brazil, South America, and African countries. Also, the dynamics of spatial temporal dissemination of distinct HIV variants in Brazil, Americas, and Africa. As you can see here, we have a long term collaboration. Uh, with the Pasteur Institute and other French research institutions. So back in the 80s, you can see here Dr. Marisa Morgado, the former director of the lab, did her PhD thesis in, at the Pasteur Institute. So 
Those are all people from our lab that have been trained at the Pasteur Institute. So I, I didn't say in the beginning of my talk, but we are doing uh, a, a joint uh, presentation, me and Daniel. So we are going to split part of the presentation and switch places sometime. So the next uh, step is Daniel is going to present and introduce his lab. Our lab in Pasto, yes. Uh, this is uh, our lab in, in Pasto. Uh, the director is Francois Barres in UC. Um, we are now two, uh, two teams in, in Pasto. This is our team. Uh, we have two PIs, Lawrence uh, Weiss and myself. We have uh, two postdocs, one Mexican, one Indian, uh, and one Tunisian is Sri Vidya. As you know, Francois goes to the retirement next August. Uh, our team uh, will move to the Cytokina Information Lab. Uh, the director is Jean-Marc Cavallon, working also in the community, but in bacterial infection, no viral infection. Uh, I'd like to show some of the cohort study we are doing now. Um, I started with the international cohort study, only in HIV infection. We have uh, one cohort to study in Cambodia, is a, a HIV and TB co-infected patient. Another uh, equivalent cohort here, and we showed later the preliminary results. Uh, one more in Mexico City is the early acute HIV infection. Uh, other cohort we started this year is HIV and hepatitis B and C co-infected patient. Uh, also in Fiocruz, but in, in Mato Grosso do too. Uh, the main gateway for this cohort is biomarkers. We try to identify biomarkers for prediction, pronostic, uh, treatment response. Uh, we applied this year for uh, uh, our project concerning long non-coding RNA and microRNA as biomarkers of viral disease. <clears throat> in France, we have mm, three different cohorts now concerning HIV, no hepatitis. Uh, one is uh, HIV editing controllers, uh, HIV post-treatment controllers. All these uh, cohorts are from INRS. Uh, the other one is uh, the study in infants, uh, the French pediatric cohort. E, the main thing or here is the, the role of NK cell in the control of HIV and replication. As you know here, we had a lot of data coming from these different neurological studies. Also, as it's not shown sure here, but the local normal population of blood donors, normal blood donors. We can share with the bioinformatics all of this. Uh, also, we are indicated in uh, vaccine uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, Vaccine Research Institute. Uh, we have explored these different uh, projects, our project concerning the, the role of uh, uh, natural killer cells in response to the dated cell loaded with HIV antigens. And the other members of the group working in T cells, on viral reservoir, or also in, in mucosa eliminating and specific immunity. Uh, the following acts in our team now is the characterization of double negative gamma delta T cells, the study of signal impact waste, pathways in, on NK cells implicated in the cold trauma of HIV replication, uh, transcriptome analysis of the NK cells stimulated by a vaccine candidate by, sponsored by the NRS, and uh, also some markers of the immunoreconstitution syndrome in Cambodia. Uh, now we are a team, cooperating team. <laughs> this is what I call this is what I call a true collaboration. So we are splitting the presentation too. So 
Um, so this introduction was just to let you know the main research areas that we have been working on and just to broaden our collaboration for all the institutes and people that are here sharing this symposium. So uh, our study is the innate, uh, the characterization of innate immunity and the biomarkers in TB HIV co-infected patients. This study was proposed back in 2011 by Marisa and Daniel. And here is part of the team that has been working on this project. So just a little bit of background. So you all know that HIV TB co-infection poses enormous scientific and public health challenges. So tuberculosis remains an important public health problem in Brazil, which ranks the 17th on the list of 22 high burden TB countries in the world. And it's the leading cause of death among HIV infected patients. So although the use of antiretroviral virus during TB treatment improves the survival of patients, it's especially by restoring the immune function the management of antiretrovirus and TB drugs is really very difficult. So, especially due to the drug interactions and by the inflammatory syndrome related to the immune reconstitution, what we call iris. And the clinical and lab factors associated to the onset of iris are not yet clearly understood. And the understanding of its pathogenesis and identification of prognostic biomarkers are important to allow better clinical management of the patients. So, the published results obtained in the TB HIV cohort under highly active antiretroviral therapy and tuberculosis therapy, uh, the Camellia. Uh, protocol indicated that the occurrence of iris might be explained by an exaggerated response of the innate immune cells due to an increased degranulation activity of NK cells. So the measurement of CD107A marker before the initiation of heart in iris patients was significantly higher than in non-iris cases. So the CD107A marker at baseline was associated to the development, development of iris, iris. So based on these optimistic results of the Camellia protocol and some previous data that we have uh, in studies that we have begun in our lab studying iris in TB HIV co-infected patients and some training that we did with Daniel at the Pasteur Institute so he was just introducing us to the innate immunity so we decided to apply uh, in 2011 to the uh, protocol entitled characterization of innate immunity and biomarkers in TB HIV co-infected patients. This protocol was approved in January 2012 and the first participant was enrolled in January 2014. There was a lapse of two years, so a, a little bit of delay to start enrolling patients because uh, the process for the ETSCIS committee approval was really slow so it took a lot of time to, to get the local approval and the national approval for the ETSCIS committee. So that's why we enrolled the first participant only in January 2014. So the primary objective is to study the implication of the innate immune responses, especially the NEK cell responses, and associated biomarkers in evolution of HIV infection in TB HIV co-infected patients. A secondary objective, it's important to study the role of innate immunity, 
especially NK cells, and the physiopathology of TB and HIV infection. The identification and implication of gamma delta T cells, in this case of Iris in HIV and TB co-infected adults. The implication of T cells with T cell receptors uh, alpha beta. The biomarkers of iris for prognosis and diagnosis and predictive tests of the syndrome and evaluate the T cells like sp 4 and C8 subsets. So this is a prospective study of a cohort of HIV infected adults followed at the National Institute of Infectology Evandro Chagas at Fio Cruz and Hospital Geral de Nova Iguaçu with patients with TB and HIV and pulmonary or extra pulmonary TB. So we estimated to enroll uh, four arms in this study, patients with TB and HIV, 100, patients with HIV only, 25, patients with tuberculosis, only 25, and health individuals, that would be our controls. So, for the update of enrollments, we have already enrolled 11 of the HIV and TB uh, patients in this arm. Uh, almost all the HIV positive participants. 19 out of 25 for the tuberculosis only, and we have already screened 25 health individuals. So we have ruled out other infections, HIV, hepatitis B and C, so they are uh, able to be enrolled in the cohort soon. The main inclusion criteria for the HIV and TB group is to have more than 18 years of age, to have a confirmed HIV infection, be antiretroviral naive, have less than 200 cells, CD4 cells, this is for the close to the TB diagnosis, confirmed TB infection, and having signed an informed consent form. So these are the timelines that we are looking for the patients, for the TB, HIV co-infected co patients, the HIV and the TB only. So for the TB, HIV, we first start uh, TB treatment for 15 days and then we start antiretrovirals after the second week of treatment for TB and then follow them up to uh, the end of the treatment for TB. And then we have for the uh, HIV patient two determinations. In the TB, we have three determinations, and the last one when participants stop treatment for TB. So I won't go in much detail for the methods because most of you are well known of the methods that we used to. Uh, treat the samples and what we have been doing. So I will pass to Daniel so that he can present some of the, our preliminary data. This is very preliminary data, but anyway, uh, I think this will bring some uh, discussion <coughs> for all of us here. <coughs> This is yours for the demographic. Okay. <laughs> this is the joint uh, presentation. Okay, so we have the three arms here. We didn't present the uh, controls because, as I have said before, we have already screened them but not enrolled. That's why they have not been uh, analyzed and they are not here. So. It seems that the age is similar, uh, a little bit for the, the, the HIV positive ones, they are a little bit younger, but 
it seems that they are pretty the same. So most of them are male uh, at this point. So, and most frequent uh, form of TB was pulmonary for the HIV TB and for the TB. 84% for the TB cases were pulmonary uh, tuberculosis and for the HIV TB, 64% of them had pulmonary, pulmonary uh, infection. Uh, it's similar here also, most of them are non-white uh, uh, people and the schooling, about the schooling, they all, it seems that they all have pretty the same, the fundamental, what we call here, uh, schooling um, for the, those participants. As you can see, we had two cases out of, uh, out of uh, 11, we had two cases of IRS at this point, so 18% at this point. You can see also that the baseline CD4 counts is really low for the HIV arm and for the HIV TDR with a median of 33 cells. So it's really very low. So, so they are people that are with very uh, severe HIV infection, advanced. And the CD for, for the TB only, the median is 630. <coughs> CD8, we have similar uh, medians for all of them, and higher, a little bit higher uh, HIV RNA for the HIV TB cohort, and uh, a little bit lower, but, but similar to the HIV only uh, participants. Well, this is some preliminary data from our study. As uh, Jose said, uh, Carmen and Jose <coughs> came to my lab to uh, learn about the techniques. Also, this is important, I discussed during the coffee break, because we need to compare these results with Camellia results of a results in NK safe in Canada. And we need to have very standardized techniques in order to compare the different results. Uh, here you have the different levels of uh, NK and NKT cells in black, NK cells in white, NKT. Um, this is the different groups of the study, HIV, TB, and co-infected patients. And here is the percentage of the levels of the different population. It's easy to, to read this slide. You don't have no evident difference between the different groups in the levels of the two, two populations. Uh, this is uh, the um, technique for the uh, NK activity. That means cytolytic activity and cytokinic secretion. Uh, this is only standardized between Cambodia and here, and in Mexico. Uh, the technique is concerned the uh, detection of this marker, CD178, and this is the technique, the technique will be for the for the detection of uh, intracellular cytokinase and extracellular detection of the marker. And here you have a typical dot plot analysis in cytometry. Um, here you have the NK T cells, which is a CD3 marker, and here are the poor NK cell population, uh, which doesn't express uh, the CD3 marker. And here the secretion of the uh, interferon gamma in this case. This is uh, the activity of NK cells between HIV TB and HIV TB uh, co infected patients. In condition, in condition of non-stimulation or stimulated by the target cell line K562, this is a classical target for human NK cells. This is percentage of expression of the marker. Um, as you can see here also 
either in non-stimulated condition or after stimulation with the target cells, uh, there is no any difference between the groups. But here you have also some high levels of the NK cells activity. Uh, we cannot show the iris patient because we don't have enough patient for iris, but uh, that's a clear uh, similar to the results obtained in camellia patient. We have higher activity in HLB TB co-infected patient. For the NKT, NKT cytolytic activity here, it's uh, the same case, not stimulated or stimulated. Um, the different groups and the percentage, uh, we don't have any different uh, concerning the NKT cytolytic activity between the groups. Uh, we also today the CD4 and CD8 subpopulation uh, is shown here the getting a strategy for the detection of different populations. Here is the CD4 marker and here is the uh, CD8 uh, marker. Uh, we can study the different marker concerning the, uh, the different subsets of CD4 or CD8 cells and uh, also the aggression marker we use C, uh, 38 and HLA DR for the activation. Uh, this is a bulk result of the different groups, co-infected patients, HLB and TB, and here we have the different population concerning CD4 uh, T cells. Uh, you have some different already known in during HLB infection. The, for example, here the central memory cell is lower in HLB TB co-infected patients compared to the other groups. Uh, also, in the case of uh, the, the terminal memory, uh, memory uh, cells, you have the higher concentration in the co-infected group. Um, for the activation, uh, this is uh, uh, different from the Camellia uh, results. We have uh, higher activation in HIV uh, patient, but no different between TB or HIV TB co-infected patients. This is uh, the result for a CD8 uh, population. Uh, here you have the different population, and you have uh, some difference between co-infected patient and HIV and TB more infected patient. Uh, thank you. Bonsoir. Good afternoon. Uh, So I want to, to present, first I want to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our work. I'm Fabrice uh, Kratien, working in the Institute Pasteur, and uh, I will explain you how we uh, decided to work with uh, some of the partners, such as our uh, Brazilian uh, collaborators, uh, to work on the pathophysiology of neurological uh, disorders during sepsis. Uh, the first part of the presentation will be a general overview of the consortium that we have created and after I will present you some preliminary data on the muscle uh, tissue that we obtain during sepsis and after Patricia will present some data on the cognitive decline uh, during sepsis. So uh, as you probably know septic uh, shock as well septic shock as well as uh, severe sepsis is a major cause of mortality it concerns 20 to 30 million of patients per year and most of these patients, more, more or less 50% of these patients will develop during their stay in ICU, in intensive care units, neurological uh, affection. It's not a clear infection of the system, the, the central nervous system, but it's this dysfunction, disconnection of the central nervous system and the muscle due to the sepsis and the, the general inflammation. And this sepsis, this neurological uh, involvement, uh, such as septic encephalopathy, it's, it's an independent factor of mortality, and uh, it uh, causes a lot of sequelae. Uh, encephalopathy leads to, uh, for example, uh, cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease, and neuromyopathy leads to uh, muscle weakness and disabilities. So three years ago, we, we met with uh, Tarek Sharsha, which is working in my uh, unit. He is professor of uh, intensive care uh, in the uh, in Poincaré Hospital in Paris, and Fernando Boza, working in uh, Fiocruz in, in Rio. 
and uh, we make the, the, together the point that is the, the pathophysiology of this neurological uh, affection during sepsis is very poorly known and we decided to create a task force and this task force associates research institutes such, such as Pasteur Institute and Fiuk Rouge and also university hospitals where the clinical research is done and also industrial partners such as uh, Air Liquide that joined us uh, three years ago. So this task force do experimental science mostly in animal models development and study of new drugs and new targets, but also clinical research, and we are belong, we belong to an uh, excellency network called CRAN, which is an European network. Uh, for the time being, as an example, I will not discuss that today, but we have two clinical studies that are uh, ongoing, uh, both uh, in Rio and Paris together, one which is uh, in the consequences of uh, sepsis, long term after the discharge of ICU, and the other one is the muscle evacuation of patients that discharge from ICU. We have also set up a, a, a biobank, and uh, especially for human uh, brains, and we have in this month more than 100 brains now, uh, patients that died from sepsis. And also we are doing animation and teaching uh, in one PhD school every uh, year in Pasteur and also uh, an international meeting in Pasteur that will that we, uh, take place uh, next week, which is called NICES. Registrations are closed now, but you can join us for the next uh, meeting in 2016. So, during uh, sepsis, you can have, as, as I told, cognitive impairment and uh, neuromyopathy as a consequence of this. Uh, this neurological dysfunction during sepsis. And I will present you today the, the, the data that we obtained on the, on the muscle feed. Uh, most of the, the, the patients, and 50% of the patients that, uh, that, that leave the ICU will have muscle weakness, and this muscle weakness is, uh, was known to be due to an imbalance between proteic synthesis and degradation regulation. So the patient lost some muscle when they are in the ICU, but what is really surprising is that the muscle and the liver are the two tissues that regenerate pretty well in the body. So why this patient keep this muscle weakness up to five years after the discharge of ICU? And you have to know that most of these patients are unable to work after uh, the, 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 the sepsis episode. Then we decided to uh, look at the muscle regeneration capacity in, in, in during sepsis. So just to remind you that the muscle tissue is really well organized, we have the muscle fibers that, that are contractile fibers, and you have in this muscle proper stem cells that are called satellite cells. These satellite cells are able to form muscle when you inject the muscle. They are located beneath the muscle fiber basal lamina, and they are close to muscle vessels, and it, it, it's considered at their niche, uh, the stem cell niche. If you uh, for if, if you do muscle injury, the muscle satellite cells are very efficient to regenerate the muscle and usually up to three weeks after the injury, the muscle is completely regenerated, both in human and in, uh, in uh, mouse. To study this stem cell, we have developed an animal model, a transgenic animal model, it's called the pac 7 GFP animals. In these mice, all the satellite cells express the GFP, you can follow them here, the which are not a really good quality, but uh, it's a very useful tool to study these stem cells because there are not so uh, many in the tissue. You have more or less seven sat satellite cells per muscle fiber and 1,000 muscle fiber per muscle in the, in the mouse, so you don't have that much size. The, the sepsis model that we are using is the peritonitis model with a sickle and ligature function. punction. So, how is the muscle during sepsis? In this animal model, we can follow every day the, the, the muscle by, by doing well, biopsies or, or, or looking at the histology of the muscle. And as previously uh, published in human, the muscle histology is completely normal. We don't have any differences between the control mice and the septic mice without any injury. The, 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 the appearance of the muscle is normal, the number of stem cells is conserved, the percentage of uh, cells, inflammatory cells resident in the tissue is the same, you don't have any inflammation, the treatment of, of inflammation, fiber size 
is exactly the same, capillarization, vascularization of the muscle is also the same, and fiber, fiber typing is the same. So there are no obvious difference between a septic muscle and a normal muscle. But if you, the, the only difference that we observe is hypoxia, you have a transi transitory hypoxia in the muscle one day after the induction of the sepsis, and it will return to normal, and you have measured this, this hypoxia in the tissue by two approaches, a probe called hypoxy probe, and also MRI in these small animals, and all, in all the cases, at one day after the, the, the injury, probably due to hypovascularization, you have hypoxia. So what happens if you do an injury to the muscle? And it's known in the muscle biology field that the best way to investigate the muscle is not to look at the muscle in the resting state, but to force the muscle to regenerate, which is something that, is, that, that could be considered as an aging protocol or, or a regeneration approach. So we have done the following experiment, do sepsis and at the same time do an injury in the muscle and the, the protocol that we are using is the classical notexin injury, we inject the snake venom in the muscle, you have a complete necrosis of all the muscle fibers and after they regenerate, and three weeks after the muscle is completely regenerated. And if you do uh, this injury protocol in mice, that under the sepsis, you have a complete defect of muscle regeneration. As you can see in this picture, it's very clear. You have the muscle fibers and a lot, a lot of calcium deposits. So you don't have any regeneration, you have a lot of fibrosis. And, it, and concerning the satellite cells, the muscle stem cells, you have a decrease of the number of satellite cells. 80% of the satellite cells died, and the remaining satellite cells are unable to divide. So it's not the case only if you do the, the, the injury and the sepsis at the same time, but if you wait four days, three weeks or three months after the, the, the sepsis, you still have this defect in regeneration. And the problem that you have in the satellite cells is related to mitochondria. You have, to be short, less mitochondria, you lose 80% of your mitochondria, and the 20% of the mitochondria that remain in the cells have DNA damage, they change the uh, metabolism of the cells that switch from the, the, glycolyt the, the, the uh, oxidative uh, pathway to the glycolytic pathway. And this defect of mitochondria is really important because if you stimulate the cells for the muscle regeneration, then the cell is unable, the mitochondria are unable to produce sufficient ATP level and then the cell undergo apoptosis. So how could, you, could we reverse this phenotype, we decided to uh, look at a, a, an approach which is quite fashion, the mesenchymal stem cells. As you know, these mesenchymal stem cells are proposed for a lot of treatment right now. These cells that you could observe in many tissue, mostly in the bone marrow, but they are also found around each vessels of, the, of different tissues. They are known to be immunomodulatory cells, they are metogenic effects, angiogenic effects, anti-apoptotics, and also anti scanning so we have done the following experiment, do the muscle regeneration and sepsis together and inject in the muscle or IP the mesenchymal stem cells and as you can see the muscle regenerate pretty well and all the parameters that we observe in the satellite cells recover. It's really surprising, we have done the experiment tons of times and you decrease the cytokine levels in the blood of the mice mitochondrial status is restored and the mesenchymal stem cells also uh, correct the damage that we observe in the mitochondrial DNA of the stem cells. What is really surprising is that we observe that these mesenchymal stem cells by experience of co-labeling are able to transfer some mitochondrial material in the satellite cells that are affected and that's, that's probably the way for them to, to help to correct the defects. So, neurological consequences of sepsis need really to be investigated because little is known of the pathophysiology of this disease which is frequent and with a lot of impact in public health. The sepsis related neuromyopathy as I presented is related to regenerative dysfunction and stem cell impairment that you could correct with MSC 
uh, treatment in the cells and it corrects also the mitochondria uh, dysfunction. What are the perspectives of this work? I, I, I will let Patricia explain me what we are doing in the brain. But it's due to translational research from bench to the bedside and confirm what we observe in the mice in human tissue. So it's easier in the muscle tissue than in the brain, as you can imagine. Uh, some studies now, some patients faced three studies by treating patients with mesenchymal stem cells and we will have access to samples from this patient to see if they correct the uh, phenotype that we could observe in the muscles. And also for us it's really important now to look at what the mesenchymal stem cell effect in other organs such as the central nervous system. So just acknowledgement, uh, there's the guy the, the, the people that are written in red are the guys that participate actively to the, to the sepsis research. And I thank you for your attention and let Patricia continue. So, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the committee organizer of the event, so we invited me to present the, this data. And uh, as Fabrice Christian told, I will present to you the data that we have in relation to the cerebral involvement uh, and cognitive impairment to infectious disease and I will focus on malaria infection and sepsis. So, we know that so far that the cognitive impairment can start with a trauma or stroke or even a neurodegenerative disease. But recently we have given a focus on the cognitive decline due to infectious diseases and metabolic diseases. We know that you know that during learning, uh, the conversation with the glial cells, with neuronal cells, is necessary to all the physiological signaling to form a memory and to 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 form memory. But however, when you have some injury caused by pathogens or bacterial, you can have an enhanced production of the cytokines that uh, now is not uh, contributing to the learning process, now they start to contribute to the, can contribute to neuronal death, and we ha can have the activation of these cells and can develop, uh, now we can observe the uh, process of neuronal death. This phenomena we can call of neuroinflammation and it can lead a lack of memory and learning. So, what we will present today is that once we have activation of glial cells and enhance of production of cytokines, you can, you now we can show you that doing different kind of infection like malaria and sepsis, we can have the same profile of the response, of the inflammatory response, and also the same profile of the lack of the cognition. And once we have the same response, inflammatory response, and same mechanism that led, that led to the, the cognitive decline, why not you can propose in here the same uh, therapeutic approach? So, the first point that I'm going to talk to you is the reformation. And during sepsis, you can observe that we have an enhancement of the um, synthesis of pro inflammatory cytokines in brain tissue, like IL 1, IL 6. Uh, chemokine like KCMCP1, showing that we have an inflammation in brain tissue during sepsis. The same is observed in malaria infection and can observe that we have an enhance of IL1, NCP1, TNF, and IL12 on day 6 post malaria infection, showing that we have an enhance of cytokines in brain tissue and this can be associated to neuronal dysfunction and maybe cognitive decline. We also observe, it's not so good the image, but we can show here in a larger image that we have the activation of microglial cells. Microglial cells are well known as a macrophage of the central nervous system and they possibly can be involved in the neuroinflammation and also cognitive decline. And during sex you can observe uh, activation of the cells that can contribute to neuroinflammation and cognitive decline. The same is observed by the malaria infection. In here, we can observe the day six post infection, the activation of microglial cells, showing that that mechanism of enhance of cytokines 
and activation of microglial cells is the same in both conditions. Oxidative stress, stress is also a mechanism that has been very, very talked about when we talk about uh, uh, neurological diseases. And you can observe that during sex we have an enhancement of lip peroxidation in brain tissue, in sepsis, and also you can observe during malaria infection an enhancement of lip peroxidation by MDA uh, assay, we have an enhancement of lipid peroxidation and also the initial of the antioxidant defense, showing that we have in the mouse brain both sepsis and malaria infection, we have an enhancement of the oxidative damage. Talk now about the neural dysfunction, <coughs> mainly to focus in here in the synaptic proteins. Basically, the synaptophysin is, is a protein that is found in presynapsis terminal and also PNCD95 is, is found in postsynaptic uh, uh, area. In sepsis, we can observe that we have a diminished amount of the relation of synaptophysin and psd 5 showing that we have a dysfunction of synaptic during sepsis. The same profile can observe in malaria infection, whereas you can, you can observe that we have a diminishing level of synaptophysin in day 6 post-infection is the same time that we observe the cerebral malaria. Uh, in this, it's this figure like I show you in the Day 15 of infection, that when we have evaluate the cognitive decline, we observe a reduction of the protein PSD95 that's fundamental to the signaling of memory, to formation of memory, and it's, the, it's diminishing in animals that are recovered from cerebral malaria. We also ask ourselves if the excitotoxicity mechanism involved during malaria infection and in the end, uh, leads a uh, cognitive impairment. And we, we know that during acetotoxicity, due to uh, uh, enhanced soft activation of receptor NMDA, we have uh, uh, a flux of calcium, in, intercellular calcium, that can lead to uh, dysfunction of micro, micro, uh, mitochondria, that in combination of enhanced soft expression of uh, neuronal uh, oxidative synthase, you can enhance the amounts of nitric oxide that combinate can form the peroxynitrate and peroxynitrate can lead to cellular and neuronal death. So we will ask yourself if you have any changes during malaria in this mechanism. So you can observe here in RNA levels of animals uh, are enhanced in the six post infection in malaria and also in protein levels of uh, Nitric oxide, neuronal nitric oxide, I have said showing that maybe this mechanism can contribute to neuronal death. But now it's, it's, uh, we need to prove that we have neuronal death. And this slide we show that on the, the same time that we have the enhance of the neuronal nitric oxide form, we have also the enhance of the cleavage caspase free, showing that maybe in malaria infection we have a, a neuronal death associated with the cognitive decline. So, we have shown so far the mechanism of uh, probably we have a toxicity in, neuronal, uh, in neurons in both sepsis and malaria. What about cognitive decline? And we know that clinical research has shown that cerebral malaria led to a cognitive decline uh, mainly in children under five years old. And also in sepsis and pneumonia, you observe also the cognitive decline. And our group and others have shown the cognitive impairment in sepsis and malaria and we have seen that cognitive impairment in sepsis. Uh, we can observe it post 10 days post sepsis, it can at least uh, be observed to 16 days post sepsis. However, malaria we identified the cognitive impairment day 15 uh, after infection and so far we don't have reversion of this, this condition. So, so far I have shown that we have common mechanism. Is, is it possible to propose the common uh, therapeutic approach? So, uh, this graph uh, published by, by Kelly and co co showing that during sepsis, 
animals lack the ability to have a memory of uh, habituation that is recovered by treatment with antioxidants. The same is observed in malaria infection. But mice that are recovered from the parasitic diseases lack the ability to perform the habituation memory that is reversed by treatment with antioxidants, showing that we have stress oxidative as a, a mechanism of cognitive impairment and the introduction of the therapeutic target uh, oxidative stress, you can reverse the cognitive impairment. We also studied uh, the adjunct treatment with statins. Statins we, we well we used to treat the cholesterol dyslipidemias, and we treat the statins once we observe that during the, the pathway of cholesterol synthesis, we also have inhibition not only the cholesterol formation by the treatment with statins, but also the formation of the, the radical preneal that is responsible to prenylation of this, the little GTPases that are responsible for, sev for several uh, activities in the cell. And maybe the inhibition of the GTPases can prevent the cognitive impairment. Uh, we showed him that with, during sex we have uh, capillary rarefaction and also uh, addition of leukocytes in the blood vessels during sex that he, when we start the treatment with atrovastatin we have the reversion of the capillary dysfunction and also reversal of the inflammation in the blood vessels during sepsis. The same we can observe in malaria infection that we observe also again uh, an impairment of the capillary function and addition of leukocytes in the, in, the, in the blood vessel in the brain and the treatment with lovastatin is capable to reverse both conditions showing that the, it's a, good to the brain to, to introduce the therapeutic target as a statin. What about the cognitive impairment? <coughs> we observed that uh, in sepsis that the treatment with uh, atorvastatin and sivastatin was able to reverse the uh, aversive memory, both in short and long-term memory, and also reverse the habituation memory by the water maze. Once the um, septic animals uh, has a reduction of this memory that was reversed by treatment with statins. Uh, what about malaria? Malaria, when we introduce the treatment with statins, uh, we observe also a reversion of cognitive impairment, both in habituation memory and aversive memory, showing that maybe it be useful to use statins as uh, uh, adjuvant in the therapy of sepsis and malaria. So, our hypothesis is during infectious disease, you have enhanced of neuroinflammation, production of reactivity in uh, oxygen and nitrogen species, and mechanisms that led to excitotoxicity that ends in, can end in cell death and synaptic dysfunction. And all these events together can lead to cognitive impairment. And maybe introducing therapeutic uh, agents uh, as well as antioxidants and statins, maybe others like uh, mesenchymal cells, can be, is it possible to reverse cognitive impairment with two infections? I uh, would like to thank you, all the people of the Laboratory of Human Pharmacology, uh, the Instituto de Pesquisa Evandro Chagas, in special the uh, Human Pharmacology Laboratory, the Hugo Carlos Castro Pereira, Patricia Bosa, uh, Fernando Bosa, uh, the Unit of Human Histopathology <coughs> and Animal Models, by thank you in special to Fabrice Gretchen and Tarek Chacha, because uh, some of these results I get there when I was there, I spent there for one period of three months, so some of the results I, I did there. And also the laboratory of uh, cardiovascular physiology that performed all the intravital uh, experiments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will talk about uh, uh, an overview on sugar disease.
Carlos Chagas, uh, Carlos Chagas discovered not only a new human disease in La Sanse, Minas Gerais, Brazil, but in northwestern Brazil. He discovered first the new parasite, its vectors and nomenclature reservoir, the human disease itself, and the white cycle of the infections. This is the uh, uh, unique uh, in the medical and uh, biological history of the investigation. <clears throat> he discovered the <clears throat> Pastores Megisto, that uh, he called the Conorrhinus Megistos, and uh, the Parasite, uh, he called the Critidias, uh, is called today Happy Master Good. <clears throat> he discovered the Tassipus uh, Novecento, the Armadillo, in 1912, and uh, the Trypanosoma cruzi, which he called Scusa Trypano cruzi. And I think this uh, is the Berenice, the children that the Chagas discovered the disease. He never uh, talked about this. He, he said, Berenice, two years of age, etc. etc. But uh, his photo number one, I think this is the, the person that he discovered the disease. The distribution of Chagas disease in Latin America. <coughs> the distribution by the Mexico, the south of the United States, to the south uh, of Chile and Argentina, but uh, <coughs> Uruguay, uh, Chile, and Brazil could eliminate the main vector uh, that is the atom infection, that is the most important uh, uh, vector. Argentina and Paraguay is under control of these main vectors, and uh, <coughs> In Central America, the main uh, vector uh, uh, is uh, uh, under control, and that modulus prolixus. This is the situation in Brazil. Uh, the estimative uh, is that in, in Americas, we have uh, 8 million of people infected with Trypanosoma cruzi. These uh, 8 million people, 3 million is in Brazil. In Brazil, uh, <coughs> the endemic area, uh, you see, the, the exotic area in the Amazon, Brazilian Amazon, that represents 58% uh, of the Brazilian the territory. <coughs> And uh, uh, we have isolated cases of the disease in the Amazons. Most of them, uh, the transmission, uh, we do not have uh, triatomine adapt adapted to the human dwellings, but uh, the transmission, the most important mechanism of transmission is for oral transmission, for The natural history of Chagas disease. The exotic natural infection of animal <coughs> by Trypanosoma cruzi of, <coughs> or Chagas disease episodic, which is indigenous to a certain locality. Anthropozoonosis or zoonosis maintained in the nature by animal <coughs> transmission to man and uh, he invades the animal ecoto, or when the animal and the bugs invade the human dwellings. Zoonosis and infection of infestations share in nature by men and vertebrates animals transmitted from infected 
too susceptible. Now, Fixernoz is an infection or infestation shared in nature by man and vertebrate animal, usually transmitted by vectors. <coughs> and uh, finally, zoanthroponoz, that the infection of men for the animals. <coughs> this is the interchange between white and domestic and domestic cycle. Uh, <coughs> the white cycle uh, is supposed to have uh, uh, one million of, uh, of years that is the existence of the white cycle. Uh, with this forestation, uh, the triatomine uh, came to peridomestic uh, area uh, uh, with the uh, form the peridomestic cycles that uh, is uh, uh, from the peridomestic it come to the domestic cycle that uh, in the place that uh, the uh, disease is uh, endemic. The main uh, mechanism of transmission of uh, Trichodazona cruz is by vectors, by blood transfusion, that uh, today is uh, controlled in, in Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, in part of uh, uh, Central America. <coughs> uh, oral transmission uh, through food, ingestion of food, that the main mechanism in the Brazilian Amazon across the placenta and through the birth canal in the uh, uh, the secondary uh, mechanism laboratory accident about 10% of people who work with Tritonosoma Cruz for a long time are infected by laboratory accident. Handling infected animals, organ transplantation, there is uh, several cases uh, <coughs> of uh, uh, transmission by organ transplantation, sexually uh, and criminal induced induce infection by inoculation of uh, food. There, is, uh, there are some uh, examples of this, including Brazil. The clinical phase and form of Chagas disease. Acute phase, the, the majority of the acute phase are uh, asymptomatic form, or moderate, uh, severe form, uh, main. Uh, 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 meningoencephalite and uh, myocarditis. Chronic phase in determinate form. In determinate form, is, uh, this term was created by Carl Chagas himself. Uh, that main, the, means that the person, the, the person infected, but uh, that uh, do not suffer of the disease. The digestive form, the cardiac and digestive or mixed form, and neuroautonomic form. Uh, congenital form, uh, or abort, prematurity, organic lesions, form in immunosuppression, mainly after the, uh, the AIDS, né? the evidence of AIDS, with, with evident parasitemia. Lesion of central nervous system and diff diffuse myocarditis and meningitis encephalitis. This is situa situation of acute and chronic Chagas disease. Acute, the definition of acute Chagas disease is uh, when we find uh, T cruz I in direct examination the blood direct examination, that's acute. 
Это автор Тикрузай Байблюд, и Dinâmica é um moral em mim do responso em acuta e crônica chagas de zis. De parasitíbia going up up to the 30 days and the action of antibody IgM and IgG make drop de parasitíbia an average of uh, 60 days. Then uh, the, the patient started the chronic phase of the disease. This is uh, an example of the, form, the indeterminate form of Chagas disease. The heart seems not normal. Uh, <coughs> the, the, Uh, intermediate uh, uh, form with the uh, compromise of the conductor system and uh, 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 dilatation of the heart and finally uh, great dilatation of the heart with uh, cardiac insufficiency. This is a typical a uh, case of chronic Chagas disease, enlargement of the heart, uh, 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 right when the blush block, extra systole multifocal. Cardiogram uh, uh, with uh, uh, apical aneurysma, segmental akinesia. Uh, functional evolution of Chagas mega esophagus. Uh, <coughs> we have the monomerical record of mega esophagus, grade 2. Synchron and asynchron waves. Uh, this is a normal megacolon patient, southern death from Chagas cardiomyopathy, original from medical school of the USP Ribeirão Preto, Brazil. <coughs> We have a study uh, 510 cases of chronic Chagas disease from different uh, states in Brazil. Uh, then uh, we have here 60% of case with cardiomyopathy, uh, uh, 40, about 40% 40 of patients with uh, indeterminate form, and 14% uh, uh, of the patient uh, with uh, uh, Digestive, digestive form. See, the, the, the average of uh, the peak of this manifestation from 30 to 39 years old. Uh, we 
we can divide the law distribution of Chavez disease in five groups according to the according to the country. Group one, which includes Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, Honduras, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela. Present domestic per domestic wide cycles with the zone of a high prevalence of human infection. Uh, group two which include Colombia, Costa Rica, and Mexico, present domestic, per domestic, and white cycle with presence of uh, human infection. Group three, which include El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Par Panama, <coughs> present domestic, per domestic, and white cycle, with a little clinical information of human infection. Group four, which include Antilles, Bahamas, Belize, Cuba, United States, Guiana, French, Guiana, <coughs> Haiti, Jamaica, and Suriname, present white cycle with hair, human uh, autochthonous case. And finally, that, uh, a new challenge, group five, no endemic country as Australia, Canada, Euro European countries, Japan, and the other in Asia. Asian countries, other Asian countries, and the United States, which receive migrants with shadow disease from the endemic country. It, this is a big problem, new and big problem in the last 10, uh, 15 years. That, uh, the situation in ten, uh, three, 300,000 is is estimate to have in the United States. This is a, a very important problem. CDC uh, today obliged to uh, uh, Blue Bank uh, to uh, uh, examine the the, the blood the, the blood all the blood done. We had we had that time. Uh, 5,000 uh, cases in, 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 <coughs> in Canada, 8,000 uh, cases today is more, mainly in France and Spain, in Europe, uh, estimating 3,000 3, in Japan and 3,000 in Australia. Thank you.